one of the most notorious underworld figures to ever operate in upstate New York, was Anthony Sonny Pompey. He started his underworld career during the 1920s Prohibition era and became a dominant figure in area rackets. But there was this little murder in 1936 where the victim, at his last gasp, fingered Sonny as his killer. What was that about? Let's find out. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mob Fireside Chat. At Mob Fireside Chat, we bring to life select stories from the pages of Button Guys of the New York Mafia website, the only place you need to go to learn about real mafia history. So go check out Button Guys today at www.thenewyorkmafia.com. Remember, everyone who purchases a subscription to the Button Guys world through March 31st, 2022, will automatically be entered to win 100 bucks cold hard cash. That's an offer you can't refuse. And while I have your attention, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and be sure to comment below after you watch today's video. Now, let's get on with our story about upstate New York gangster, Anthony Sonny Pompey. Enjoy. Anthony Sonny Pompey was born in 1907 in Saratoga Springs in upstate New York. Pompey was closely allied with a top Saratoga Springs-based racketeer named Louis Doc Ferrone and his two brothers, Fausto Freddy Ferrone and Alfred Chinny Ferrone. Doc Ferrone was never named as an official member of the Mafia or even directly connected to any one particular Cosa Nostra family, for that matter. Yet, Ferrone seemed to be very well known to them and respected as a longtime area bootlegger, gambler, and all-around racketeer just the same. The local newspapers called Doc Ferrone a bootleg baron, and he and his crew of men ran alcohol stills all over the Saratoga Springs area. Sonny Pompey was generally viewed by both local law enforcement and the underworld alike as Ferrone's right-hand man and closest confidant. Starting out as liquor bootleggers during the 1920s Prohibition era, Ferrone and Pompey led a large gang that operated unregistered alcohol stills producing their own unlicensed liquors, wines, and beer. The gang also regularly smuggled licensed branded spirits from over the Canadian border into Plattsburgh, New York, and then drove it down into the Albany area for eventual distribution to local speakeasies and the public. They built and operated stills in Saratoga, Schenectady, and Essex counties and controlled the entire bootlegging ring from the Saratoga headquarters. Their gang was comprised of at least 20 to 30 fellow hoodlums and bootleggers. After the repeal of Prohibition in 1933, Ferrone and Pompey turned their attention to the quickly expanding gambling rackets. They seamlessly pivoted into a variety of gambling operations, not the least of which was the operation of several high-class casino resorts, such as the Saratoga Club, the Chicago Club, and Riley's Lake House. These were high-profile venues that offered expensive dining, live entertainment in their nightclub, and an attached full-scale casino offering roulette, blackjack, slots, and other games typically found in the largest Las Vegas casinos. In addition, the two racketeers ran a large-scale horse and sports bookmaking business and a lottery numbers operation that accepted wagers from the greater Albany metropolitan area, including the cities of Albany, Schenectady, Saratoga Springs, Rotterdam, Scotia, and adjoining towns and villages. A good-looking guy with a rugged build and dark good looks, Sonny had the reputation as a strong-armed man and somebody not to play with. Over the years, Sonny Pompey and Doc Ferrone were suspected in several homicides and gangland killings. During the Prohibition era, they were involved in many known gun battles with rival bootleggers looking to rob their alcohol stash or hijack their liquor trucks. They were suspected in several killings of rivals as well. After Prohibition ended, Pompey came under suspicion and was eventually arrested for the gangland-style murder of another local hoodlum named Adam Perillo. In April 1924, Perillo had been a central figure in a major bank armored truck robbery in Montreal, Canada, where more than $142,000 was stolen. A shootout had occurred between the robbers and the truck guards. One of the guards had been killed during the robbery. Perillo and his cohorts were eventually captured and brought to justice, but Perillo ended up cutting a deal with prosecutors in exchange for a reduced charge and a reduced jail term. A highly publicized case, 
His testimony all but ensured life sentences for his bank robbery buddies. In fact, six of his co-defendants were convicted of murder. All were sentenced to the gallows, but while two got lucky and had their death sentence commuted to life in prison, four of them were not and were hanged in October 1924. Adam Perilla was allowed to plead guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to life in prison, though supposedly he was promised a 10-year sentence. But that doesn't matter because he was released on parole in August 1936 after serving only 13 years. He was immediately deported from Canada back to the U.S. and soon returned to his boyhood neighborhood of Saratoga Springs. But word quickly traveled around town that Perillo was back in town looking to make connections and get back into criminal action. He was nervously looking over his shoulder, but nonetheless still traveled to all the local watering holes, nightclubs, and gambling joints in town trying to get reestablished. On December 9, 1936, just two months after walking out of prison, the bullet-ridden body of Adam Perillo was dumped on the doorstep of a Saratoga Springs hospital. He had been shot four times in the chest and neck with a 32 caliber pistol. Supposedly, while Perillo lay dying in the emergency room, he fingered Sonny Pompey, telling police and hospital staff that Sonny shot me. Sonny was picked up and brought to police headquarters for questioning. He was held on a $10,000 bail as a material witness to the murder and remained on bail for over four years while detectives investigated the case. Eventually, he was released from custody and never charged with Perillo's murder or any other crime, at least for the time being. By 1940, Sonny and Doc Ferrone, along with over a dozen members of their crew, were indicted on federal liquor law violations related to their bootlegging activities from years back. Apparently, the gang was operating three separate but interconnected alcohol stills in the towns of Milton and Minerva in Saratoga County and on a farm in Schenectady. Ferrone and Pompey were described by federal prosecutors as the two ringleaders of the illicit bootlegging network, and both of them and the others all went to trial on bootlegging charges. After a three-week trial, they were all convicted. Ferrone and Pompey each were sent away to serve two years in prison. In April 1942, the 34-year-old Sonny Pompey, who had just been released from Atlanta Federal Penitentiary after serving his two years behind bars for that liquor conspiracy, was rearrested and charged with second-degree murder, Adam Perillo's 1936 murder to be exact. Sonny pleaded innocent but was held without bail at the Saratoga County Jail until trial. Eventually, though, he was released on a $25,000 bail package to await his day in court. Pompey went to trial that December. It was another highly publicized jury trial, but on December 17, 1942, Sonny Pompey was acquitted. The case hinged almost entirely on Adam Perillo's deathbed statement implicating Sonny, but Judge Andrew W. Ryan ruled that Perillo's statement was not admissible evidence. The point of contention was whether or not Perillo knew he was dying. Did Perillo say, am I dying or I am dying? The attending physician couldn't recall. Neither could any other hospital staff call to testify. But what probably convinced the judge that the state really had no case at all was when the doctor was called back to the stand for more clarification on what exactly Perillo said as he lay dying on the hospital bed the night of the shooting. And despite the defense's objection to every question the prosecution asked and the judge sustaining every objection made, it was the doctor's recollection of a name that ended the case right then and there. After the prosecution asked if there was anything else he could recall about Perillo's final words, the doctor replied, No, sir. I asked him his name, and he told me, Anthony Perillo. Anthony, the judge asked. The prosecution almost immediately rested their case, telling the judge they had no further evidence to present. The defense moved for an acquittal, telling the court the state had failed to prove the case at all and the judge turned around and directed the jury to return a verdict of acquittal. He told the jury that there is no evidence for you to consider here and sent the jury to deliberate. Five minutes later, the jury returned and found Pompey not guilty. He was immediately exonerated by the court. Sonny got up from the defendant's chair, conversed with his family and friends in the hallway, shook his lawyer's hand, and then strolled out of the courthouse a free man. As an interesting side note, the Saratoga Springs police chief, Patrick Rocks, had earlier testified as the conversation he supposedly had with Pompey when they pulled him in for questioning the night of Perillo's murder. Pompey asked Rocks, what do you want? Rocks said, I want you. 
Pompey replied, what for? Rex said, for shooting Adam Perillo. Pompey said, is he dead? Who shot him? Rex answered, he said you did. To which Pompey replied, he's full of shit. That alleged conversation, by the way, also didn't hold water in the courtroom. In 1951, Sonny was one of the more prominent figures among scores of Saratoga-based gamblers and hoods called before the famed Kefauver Senate Crime Committee hearings that were famously televised to the general public nightly. Headed by Senator Estes Kefauver, this committee went around the country probing the underworld and its rackets. To have been called before the committee only goes to show the prominence of the Pompeii name in underworld circles at that time. Although by then largely retired from illegal activity, his name still rang a bell. As far as legit business went, after the Prohibition years, Sonny Pompey and his partner Doc Ferrone had each gone into legitimate beverage businesses. Sonny opened up a company in his hometown of Saratoga Springs he named Saratoga Club Beverages, Inc., He owned and operated the company for years, eventually selling his interest in the firm in 1953 to two Long Island-based businessmen who purchased the bottling plant in its building and several adjoining properties in other buildings. Anthony Sonny Pompey seems to have fallen off the radar after 1959 or so. No more was ever publicly heard from him again, whether it be in innocuous local news, during criminal investigations or arrests and were sure that was by Sonny's design. During his lifetime, Sonny Pompey had seen and done it all, and although he had once been jailed for a couple of years on that bootleg case, he did escape a certain life sentence or the death chamber had he been convicted of Perillo's murder in that courtroom in 1942. So all in all, he seemed to have been a pretty lucky upstate New York gangster. And that's the end of our story on Sonny Pompey. We hope you enjoyed it. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss the next episode of Mob Fireside Chat. And be sure to visit Button Guys of the New York Mafia at www.thenewyorkmafia.com where you can read more about Sonny Pompey and others in the upstate New York underworld. And if you subscribe to the website, you will automatically be entered to win $100 cold hard cash. Thank you for watching. Until next time.